So we're going to continue on looking at linear transformations today, and then hopefully we'll get to the next section as well and start talking about matrix multiplication. But for now, linear transformation. We're looking at transformations from Rn to Rm. Those might be different sets of vectors. So we saw like the zero buffering. Um, we saw the trimming off of the last entry. Or maybe they're not. Maybe N and M are equal. And we're going from R2 to R2 or whatever. And we've said that a transformation is linear if it satisfies two conditions, the linearity condition. I guess we don't really need the subscript in that second one. We've only got one V. But so it has to satisfy this for all vectors and all scalars. If you're so inclined, this could be rewritten. As a single statement. But the, the cost of doing that is that your statement is more complicated. But you could take that addition and that pulling out the scalars and rewrite linearity as just it has to satisfy that last condition for every vector v1, v2, for every scalar k1, k2. And we've said that we've seen an important example of linear transformations come from matrix multiplication. We can define a transformation, I mean, assuming that the size is match and this matrix vector multiplication is defined. We can define a transformation using a matrix, and um, that transformation is linear. So here's our, um, here's our first example of how matrices can be used without any sort of underlying system of linear equations. And I've said this is an example, and I've said it's an important example. In a very real sense, it's the only example. In the following sense, theorem, if T of V is linear, there is a matrix A such that S T such that <coughs> this linear transformation is actually a matrix tricks vector multiplication. So every linear transformation can be thought of as matrix vector multiplication. So here's an example of, I gave this as an example of a transformation, not specifically an example of a linear transformation. 
but the truncation transformation that goes from R3 to R2 and just snips off the last element of the vector. This is, this is linear. Um, and showing stuff's linear is usually kind of banal. I mean, more tedious than anything else because we've got all of these subscripts and letters that we have to write down. But if we apply this transformation to a sum, let's do the multiple, I mean, let's do the addition. Okay, so we're applying t to this vector. It snips off that third element and we get just the first two elements. We can rewrite that as a sum when we've got addition inside a vector, we can separate it out as the sum of vectors. Then C1, C2 is what you'd get if you hit this C vector with the transformation. And D1, D2 is what you'd get if you hit this d vector with the transformation. So t of c plus d is indeed t of c plus t of d. And that's the first of those uh, requirements satisfied. And If we now have a scalar, uh, well, that scalar can go inside. The transformation cuts off that third entry. We can pull scalars out, and C1, C2 is what we get if we apply this cutting transformation. Two, C1, C2, C3. So T of KC does equal K times T of C. That's both the requirements for linearity. <coughs> so this is a linear. Now when I stated state this transformation here, there's no references to matrices. But my claim is that there is some matrix A such that this linear transformation can be thought of as matrix multiplication. There's some A such that multiplying by A cuts off that third entry, and I can think of this linear transformation now in terms of this A. 
So that's our theorem, and our theorem does better. I mean, sometimes you run into theorems that just tell you something exists, but then give you no idea of how to find it. That is not the case here. If we have the transformation, we can find the matrix A. And, um, let's see. So we've got a transformation from Rn to Rm, and we want A, and this matrix we want, what, uh, how big should it be? Well, we want to go from an n by 1 matrix to an m by 1 matrix. Yeah, <laughs> that really got uh, stuff together in a visually not great way, but for this multiplication to be defined and to take us where we want it to take us, to go from Rn to Rm, we need A to be M by N. So M rows N columns. And I've said before that we often think of matrices as being vector storage units, a bunch of columns sitting next to each other. So to find A, we're going to find each column of A individually and then put them together. To do this, we need some special matrices, special vectors, sorry, that we'll call E sub I. And these vectors have names, but it's a little awkward. I mean, these are the vectors of the standard basis of Rn or like the standard basis vectors, but we're not going to define a basis for a few, some time yet. So using that word is a little awkward. Um, but this vector is one in the ith entry zero, Elsewhere. So if we're in R3, for example, E1 has a 1 in the first entry, it's 0 everywhere else. E2 has a 1 in the second entry, it's 0 everywhere else. E3 has a 1 in the third entry, it's 0 everywhere else. Uh, making this slightly more awkward is the fact that if you've taken calculus 3, these vectors get used a lot in calculus 3, but they get called something different. I, K, I, I forget all the letters that are used, but they have different names in calculus 3 than they do in linear algebra. That's just one of those things. But 
To find this make to find the matrix of a linear transformation, <clears throat> the matrix of a linear transformation. So from Rn to Rm, we're going to take the linear transformation and we'll apply it to E1, and that will be the first column. Then we'll take the transformation and apply it to E2, and that will be the second column. And we are looking for n columns. You always have to think whether we're ending at n or m, but you apply the transformation to each vector in this so-called standard basis. Again, we haven't defined a basis, but to each of these E sub i's, and this gives you the matrix of the linear transformation. And again, what I mean by that is that you've got this linear transformation. It's maybe not defined in terms of matrices. It's maybe defined in terms of buffering extra zeros or snipping entries off. But you can think of it in terms of matrix multiplication. There is a matrix A such that T of V equals A times V. And since we've already looked at an example, what better place to go for our um, first example of this theorem. So, we've defined this linear transformation that cuts off the third entry. And we've demonstrated that it's linear. And you have to be a little careful when you use this theorem because, I mean, <coughs> if T isn't linear, there's, there's nothing to stop you from creating this matrix, but the matrix won't do what you want it to do. So we have to be sure that the transformation we're looking at actually is a linear transformation. We've checked that this is. Um, so applying the material from the previous frame, to create the matrix of this linear transformation, we should apply T to E1, and we should apply T to E2, and we should apply T to E3. When we apply T to E3, the 1 gets snipped and we're left with 0, 0. And then we should take these vectors and we should line them up next to each other in a matrix. And my claim 
is that this matrix um, performs the snipping, or I guess truncation is the fancy word, but this matrix performs the snipping transformation. If we take this matrix, and we multiply it, by a vector in R3, we'll get the vector in R2 that is produced by snipping away C3. And hopefully by now you're comfortable with matrix vector multiplication, and you can just see that 1 times C1, 0 times C2, 0 times C3, put them together, we do get C1. Zero times C1, one times C2, zero times C3, put them together, we do get C2. So this does do what it's supposed to do. One more example, but it's a really famous example. So first of all, does anybody have questions? So this really famous example, as I call it, is on the plane, and the transformation in question is the rotation. We can visually depict vectors in R2 as line segments connected to the origin. So we can take a vector in R2 and we can rotate it counterclockwise by some angle theta. And I'm claiming that this is a linear transformation and that therefore rotation by theta is the same as multiplying by some matrix. And I've said this example is famous. It's going to sort of form the foundation of a few whole sections down the line. For now, we'll just find the rotation matrix. We'll find the matrix that does this. We should also, I mean, we should try to convince ourselves before we do that, that this really is linear, because it's not obvious, or at least I don't think it's obvious, that like adding two vectors and then rotating them is the same as rotating two vectors and then adding them. Let's try to give a visual argument, and let's start with the more straightforward one. The T of KV equals K times, sorry, not times V. but times t of v. So here's a vector v. Um, let's say that when we rotate my total lack of artistic skills are coming to the fore here. But let's say when you rotate V, you wind up in the second quadrant. 
croquet times V. That's a scalar product. It's going to take V and it's going to scale it, either stretch it or compress it. Let's say it stretches it. So there's K times V. Similarly, K times T of V is um, got in by taking that vector T of V and stretching it. And my claim, which I hope is visually clear, is that if I take this vector k of v and I rotate it, I take um, t of k of v, I'll wind up here. I'll wind up at k times t of v. And I mean, this is, again, I hope so just visually that rotates to that. I mean, this is, you can think of this as being like a stick or a rod or some solid object. If the midpoint of this rod rotates to the midpoint of this rod, then the end of the rod rotates to the end of the rod. And this rotation matrix, I mean, this rotation transformation takes kV to k times t of v. So it satisfies that linearity condition. What about this linearity condition? Okay, so here's U, here's And we take this thing, we take um, each of these vectors and we rotate them. And again, let's just say for ease of drawing this, that everything winds up in the second quadrant. There's T of U and there's T of V. And the parallelogram rule, the parallelogram principle, tells us we can think of addition in terms of parallelograms. Here is not T, here is U plus and here, is T of U plus T of V. And our claim is that if we take U plus V and hit it with T, we should end up there. And again, this is a geometric argument. Now, instead of thinking of having a rod, think of having a plate. You've got this plate, you're rotating it. One side of this plate rotates here. The other side of this plate rotates there. So this side of the plate must rotate here, 
and this side of the plate must rotate here. If you've got this solid plate and two of the sides rotate to some fixed position, the other two sides rotate by the same number of radians or the same number of degrees. And in particular, this vertex of the plate here does have to rotate to this vertex of the plate here. If you, again, if you just think of this as being a solid object that you are rotating, it should hopefully be very clear that this corner gets rotated to this corner. And this is the statement that t of u plus v equals t of u plus t of v. So this is linear. It's not obvious when you first see it, but it is. And it therefore must be um, describable in terms of matrix vector product. There must be a matrix such that rotating by theta radians is the same as multiplying by that matrix. Let's find it. We're in R2. So we're going to look at T of 1, 0. And we're going to look at t of 0, 1. We're in R2, so we only have two e's, e1 and e2. All right. 1, 0 is there. We rotate. by theta radians. This vector has a unit of one. We rotate it by theta radians. We still have a length of one. Draw in our unit circle. And now we can see that this point we've rotated to has as its x-coordinate the cosine of theta, and it has as its y-coordinate the sine of theta. So 1, 0 goes to the cosine of theta, the sine of theta. What about, don't want to erase anything, what about 0, 1? Well, 0, 1's there. We rotate by theta radians. We wind up here. This triangle in blue and this triangle in red, maybe I should say this triangle in the second quadrant and this triangle in the first quadrant are uh, my high school geometry is failing me. All of the angles must be the same because um, theta is the same, and the right angle is the same, and the angles add up to 180 degrees, or pi radians. All of the lengths have to be the same, because all of the angles are the same, and the hypotenuse is the same. The hypotenuse is 1. So, equilateral. Is that what I'm looking for? There are two triangles and the angles and the sides are all the same. So 
as far as the x coordinate and the y coordinate, well, those lengths are the same. So this is the sine of theta. So this is the sine of theta, but we're going negative. We're going into the second quadrant, so that's negative the sine of theta. Then this and this are the same. Um, this distance is the cosine of theta. So that distance is the cosine of theta. And if we put these uh, vectors together, we get the matrix of the transformation. We get what's called the rotation matrix. So multiplying by this matrix, We'll take a vector and it will rotate it in the plane by theta radians. I mean, I guess I haven't done anything that requires theta to be measured in radians. It's just what I'm used to, but by either theta radians or theta degrees in the counterclockwise direction. And I mean, I think this is a pretty interesting and powerful result. I mean, when you first see matrix vector multiplication defined, you sort of accept it because, because I say it's right and because we can rewrite systems of linear equations but there's nothing in the definition of matrix vector multiplication that intuitively would make you think you can use it to talk about rotations in the plane. We have just seen, though, that you can. So this is um, a very powerful definition, much more than just another way of talking about systems of linear equations. Because, I mean, there are no systems of linear equations underlying this example. Um, why does this work? by the way. Let's just give a pseudo-proof. Pseudo-proof because I don't feel like working in complete generality with n's and m's and all sorts of dots. Let's just look at the case where we're going from R2 to R2 and T is a linear. Our claim is that T of C1, C2 is the same as a matrix times C1, C2, a specific matrix. Um, that we've just described. And the, the basis of this argument, and we'll come back to this later. This is a really important idea. That a vector <coughs> can be described as a linear combination of simpler vectors. 
vectors. C1, C2 is C1 times E1 plus C2 times E2. Is that clear to everyone? And that's are way back. I said, okay, here's linearity. If we prefer a more complicated equation, we can think of linearity as just any transformation that makes this true. So except that we have C's and E's instead of K's and V's, this is precisely what we just saw on the last frame. So this is C1 times T of E1 plus C2 times T of E2. And any linear combination of vectors can be written as a matrix times a vector. Another way of saying that is that every vector equation is also a matrix equation. In particular, it's the matrix that has as its columns T of E1 and T of E2. The vector stores the scalars. And this is precisely what we wanted. The transformation applied to C is this matrix T of E1, T of E2 times C. So, and I mean, as I say, I spared myself writing a bunch of subscripts and a bunch of dots, but I hope it's clear that, you know, if we were going from R5 to R2 or whatever, this argument, you take the vector, you break it up using these E's, then you get have this, you hit it with linearity, you get this combination of vectors, this combination of vectors is rewritten as a matrix times a vector. Nothing in this argument required us to be going from R2 to R2. And in fact, none of, even, I mean, even what I have written on the board, There's nothing I have on the board that indicates that this is going to R2. This uh, could be going to R anything, and the stuff I have written down wouldn't change. Okay, we're not done with this section. Um, Getting to the next section is looking more unrealistic, but that's fine. I said it in my Canvas announcement that it wouldn't shock me if we didn't finish three sections <coughs> this week. Let's define one-to-one -one linear transformation. Well, I say one-to-one -one linear transformations. There's nothing in the definition that requires linearity. It's just that in this class, the name kind of gives it away. We're looking at stuff that's linear. So 
Let's define one-to-one -one linear transformations from Rn to Rm. You might have seen this if you've taken anything with Vogel. In fact, you've definite, you might have seen this if you've taken college algebra when we talk about whether a function has an inverse or not. A transformation is one to one if Every, I'm going to say this formally and then try to make it clear what I mean. If every image has only one free image, So we've got the domain, we've got the range, and the range is living inside the codomain, but don't worry about that for now. Um, in the definition of a function, it says we can't have anything that looks like that. We can't have one image um, or one value in the domain going to multiple values in the range. But there's nothing in the definition to stop you from having a picture that looks like this. Multiple values in the domain going to the same value in the codomain, in the range. So here is a situation where this image has two pre images. This image is being mapped to by this pre image and by this pre image. So a transformation is one-to-one -one if that doesn't happen. If every um, image can only have one pre-image. The, the mathier way of writing this, sort of as an equation, is to say that if T of V equals T of W if V and W are being sent to the same place, then actually V and W are the same vector. So that's one-to-one. -one. Maybe a familiar definition from college algebra or from analysis or some other upper division class. Um, onto. One-to-one -one and onto are really unrelated definitions, but they always, always get taught at the same time. So, on to um, so we've got a transformation, and that transformation has a domain, and it has a range. And that range lives inside a bigger set called
called the codomain. So the codomain is R. Um, and the range, there can be values in the codomain that are not in the range. I mean, as a, as a two minute example, we can go from R2 to R3. The zero buffering transformation. This is linear. I won't prove it for time reasons. But we've got R2, that's our domain. Only specific values in R3 are mapped to by this transformation. Because the way this transformation is defined, that third entry of the vector has to be zero. So you've got the range where the third entry is zero. And the range is sitting in R3. And there are values in R3 that are not mapped to by this function. For example, 1, 1, 1 is not in the range it isn't mapped to. A function is on to if this doesn't happen. The range equals the codomain. So this is not on to because the range does not equal the codomain. There's a point, in fact there are infinitely many points, but I just drew one in the codomain that are not in the range. So those are the definitions. And the next question we're going to ask, pretty naturally, I think, is, well, if you have a transformation, how do you decide if it's on to or not? How do you decide if it's one to one or not? And if our transformation is not defined in terms of a vector, sorry, if our transformation is not defined in terms of a matrix, then there's no one-size-fits-all way of doing that. Fortunately, we've just seen that every linear transformation can be thought of in terms of a matrix times a vector. So these are going to be very similar. Let's go through them. One to one. We've got a transformation. The question on board is, is this one Two, one. So to start with, we're going to find A. Such that this transformation is the same as matrix vector multiplication. And now we'll ask, is this one-to-one? -one? Yeah. 
And let's think through what this is asking. Being one-to-one -one says that if V and W have the same image, then V must equal W. That's the definition of one-to-one. -one. As we stated it down there. A V equals A W can be written A V minus A W equals zero. And we want to know if that means that V and W are the same vector. We can pull the A out. And now notice that V equaling W means that V minus W is zero. So what we're asking is, does the homogeneous equation AX equals zero have non-trivial solutions? If the only way for this to be true is for V to equal W, that's the same as saying the only way this homogeneous equation can be true is if this vector is zero. There's only the trivial solution. If V ever didn't equal W, then V minus W would not be the zero vector. So this homogeneous equation would have non-trivial solutions. So if that makes sense, there must be a faster way to erase. But this is one to one if AX equals zero has only the trivial solution. Which, when people struggle in linear algebra, this is a bit of an aside, but it's going to tie back into what I write now. When people struggle in linear algebra, it's usually not so much because any individual piece of the class is so difficult. It's because every piece of the class is kind of connected to every other piece of the class. And if you lose track of some earlier piece, you're going to struggle with the later pieces. So when would this only have the trivial solution? Well, it would only have the trivial solution if there are no free variables, which would happen if every column of A is a pivot column. So to, so to determine if a transformation is one-to-one, -one, 
we find the matrix of the transformation A, we hit it with Gauss-Jordan elimination because that's the only way to find the pivot positions. And then we ask if every column is a pivot column. And if the answer is yes, it's one to one. If the answer is no, it's not one to one. On to, let's, let's do one to one and on to, and then let's do an example with them both. On to is similar. So step one, find the matrix of the linear transformation. So it's on to if an equation that looks like this always has a solution. Um, because this has a solution if and only if y is in the range. And being on to says, well, everything is in the range. So, because we've recast this, we've reframed this in terms of a matrix times a vector, we're asking if that matrix equation always has a solution. And we've seen, but hope and hopefully we can dredge up We've seen when a matrix equation always has solutions. A matrix equation always has solutions if every column of the if every row of the matrix, sorry, is has a pivot position. Because if every because remember the way we wouldn't have solutions. is if we had something like this. And if every row has a non-zero entry, well, we can't have a row that looks like this. So let me just write this down. It's on to if every row has a pivot position. And of course, the key is not to confuse one to one and on to. Um, you're looking at the pivot positions in both cases, so it can be easy to do, but if you're asked whether it's on to, you're looking at the rows. If you're asked if it's one to one, you're looking at the columns. There's, there's one issue we're going to run into, and this is such an, such an annoying issue. 
It's a completely non-mathematical thing. It just happens because your calculator is not as well programmed as you might expect a hundred dollar piece of equipment to be. So in the notes, I gave a linear transformation, but we're running low on time. So let's say you found the matrix, and it's this, and you want to know whether this is one-to-one -one or on-to. Well, to answer that question, you're going to have to put this into row echelon form or reduced row echelon form. So we'll go to our matrix because we certainly don't want to keep doing this by hand. And we've got two rows and three columns. Uh, no, nope. other way around. We've got three rows and two columns. So, we go to the math. We hit RREF. And now we're getting an error message. Our calculator will not perform Gaussian or Gauss-Jordan elimination on a matrix with more rows than columns. And, and this, is it. this is nonsense. There's no mathematical reason for this. You can perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on any matrix of any size. So we have to, as ridiculous as this is to say, we have to trick our calculator. I'm going to tell our calculator, okay, why don't you add a column of zeros? And this column of zeros has absolutely no meaning. I'm purely buffering out this matrix so that it has as many rows as it has columns. Now, we can perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on our calculator. And again, this last column doesn't mean anything. It's a dummy column that we put into our calculator to make it be the right size. When we perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on this, We get that. So it's very annoying. I mean, they keep, by now it feels like there are 10 different versions of the TI-84. There's the plus and the silver and the CE and at least a few other things, and they still have not fixed this very easy to fix issue. Now, this is what happens when someone has a monopoly. Um, in terms of transformation and one-to-one -one and onto, this is not onto because there's a row without a pivot. I mean, our pivots are here and here. The third row doesn't have a pivot position. It's not onto. It is one-to-one. -one. Every column has a pivot position. 
And with that, we have finished um, linear transformations, at least for now. So there's a homework on Canvas. It's attached to this module, um, but it has problems from both this and the last section, both the linear transformation section. And when uh, Thursday will pretty much as I predicted, I think we'll finish one section and not get through the next.